Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Bible address, One Bible, Many Churches. Does it matter what we believe? You know, many people will tell you that, well, as long as you're a good person, you do things right, everything will be okay, and it really doesn't matter what you believe. But when it comes down to it, folks, it really doesn't matter what you or I think. The only thing that matters is what God thinks. And so today we're going to look into the, to the Bible, the inspired word of God, to see if it really does matter what you believe. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and we'll just dig in with a little bit of background into history. As scholars rightfully noted, Christianity is the religion that came as the result of the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's his name, Christianity. And at the time of Christ, and shortly thereafter, there was really only one teaching. There was only one group of Christians, and they all believed basically the same thing. Now, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, he says, There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who's above all and through all and in you all. So then the Bible really teaches that there is only one true faith. There's only one true body of believers. And there's only one true church. In fact, in the Bible, the word church is an interesting word. It comes from the uh, original Greek as the word ecclesia. And in our day and age, the word has actually evolved. It could actually mean the building where the people are worshiping, or it could be what the people are doing inside the building. They're having church. Or it could be, sorry, could be the believers themselves. But if you look into the dictionary, you'll find that the number one dictionary definition of the word is actually that of the building itself. In the Bible, though, this is clearly not the case. For in the, Bible, for in the Bible, without exception, it refers to the believers almost every single time. So, when we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, we find a good example. Unto the church, it's the word ecclesia, of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So, we're told... By Bible definition, it's talking about those that are sanctified, called in Christ to be saints, who call upon the name of Jesus Christ their Lord. So here we're really told that the real Bible definition is actually not a building, but the believers themselves. So when we consider our title this morning, this afternoon, pardon me, one Bible, many churches, we're really making an incorrect statement. For that matter, we're making an impossible statement. So if the word church really comes from the Greek word ecclesia, and it refers to all the believers in Christ, then there cannot possibly be many different ecclesias. There is only one true ecclesia. Yet experts tell us that there's about two billion Christians in the world today, as of 2013. And they also tell us that this, by far, is the largest religious group. And of those two billion Christians, you got about half that are Catholic. And the other half are Protestants of one form or another. And of this two billion Christian group, you have approximately 41,000 different subgroups or denominations, all calling themselves Christians. And there's, there's quite a few of them. But as we've seen what the Bible tells us, how can this be? 
where there's only one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith. Yet we have 41,000 different groups all calling themselves Christian. And that's from the center of the study of global Christianity at Gordon Cornwell Theological Seminary. So who are these groups? Well, there's quite a few of them. There's the Catholics, the Baptists, the Anabaptists, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Protestants, the Lutherans, the Mormons, the Witnesses, the Congregationalists, the Christian Scientists, Evangelists, and the list goes on and on and on. Are all of these the Ecclesia of God? Well, some would say that it really doesn't matter what you believe. As long as you believe in God and that there's a Jesus Christ to take away sins, then that's all you really need to believe. And if you believe these things, your salvation is assured because it really doesn't matter which church you go to because they're all the ecclesia of God. But please, I'd like to have you reason with me for a moment. If it really doesn't matter whether you're a Methodist or a Catholic or a Baptist, then why do we have all these different denominations today? Why aren't they all just merely Christian believers? The one ecclesia, as the Bible states. So, why is that? Why have they separated into some 41,000 different groups calling themselves a Christian religion? Well, apparently, it did make a difference at one time. And it does make a difference today. Otherwise, they'd really all join together. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, it says, quoting Jesus, it says, Then Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So Christians from the first century on have been concerned about searching and finding the truth of God's word. In about 1517, nearly all Christians were Catholics. And at that time, Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church because he didn't like what was going on. Truth mattered to him. He was a monk who left the Catholic Church because he didn't like or tolerate their ways. And in the process of time, many other groups formed because they couldn't tolerate his ways. And they broke away and thus we have the some 41,000 different denominations today. So if it really doesn't matter what we believe, then why has there been so many separations over the past 500 years or so? Obviously, many of them felt that during these years that it did matter what was believed to be the truth and what was taught and how it was taught, at least enough to break away and form their own groups. And at the time that Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church, the main cry was, the Bible is the single authority. And so they reasoned among themselves that, well, all we have to do now is to, instead of having to go to the Pope or, or go to the church for a decision on different things, all we have to do is turn up the Bible. And so, well, we know that that thinking was definitely short-lived. And in the process of time, other groups formed. We have uh, groups like the Radical Reform Movement, and they turned out to, to be the Anabaptists and the Quakers and the Separatists. And then we had the, uh, the Free Church Movement. They believed in the rights of the congregation. Uh, they were the Baptists and the Congregationalists. And then we had, of course, the Methodists in the 1700s. They thought it mattered what you believed. And so they were stressing the importance of personal devotion and morality. And so they, too, believed that it did matter, and they separated from the other churches. And, and on and on goes church history. And the major reason why we have so many different churches today is because people did feel that it mattered what you believed. Now, 
The, uh, all were looking to the Bible as the single authority for their truth. Uh, but it seems that for some reason they kept coming away with different ideas as to what the truth was. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to look at some of those reasons. Why are there so many different beliefs if they're all claiming that the Bible is the single authority to go to for truth? And which one has the truth of God? I mean, if, if the so-called scholars couldn't get it right, how do we find the truth today? So, the basis of our remarks this morning, since we... we have the Bible, we're going to look at it, and we have to ask the questions, why can't men all sit down and read the same Bible and be able to come up with, with the same doctrine, the same teaching? And so the reason for that is, is that people are just not prepared to let the Bible teach them. Now, when we consider, when we consider the doctrine, The number one reason why people have differing beliefs is that of coming to the Bible with preconceived ideas. You see, some people, they like to come to the Bible and get their previous understanding verified. So they want the Bible to tell them what they're believing is true. Instead, of coming to the Bible to believe what they find to be true. So they have a conflict there. So I'd like to kind of give you a little example of what I'm talking about here. Um, you see, everybody at some point in time had some well-meaning person tell you something that they believe. It could have been a pastor, a family member, or a friend. And you've always accepted that because it's what that person led you to believe. Well, I'm going to give you an example. And one such example, such as this, do animals go to heaven? Some well-meaning person once told me that they believe that when you die, you could take your pets with you, because animals do go to heaven. And just to prove that, they're going to go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14. And so what that reads, and the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Revelation 19, 14. You see, there you have it. A verse that proves what someone once told me, that animals go to heaven. But you have to see that this idea does not take into account that the book of Revelation is a book of sign and symbols. And it's given to us in very highly highly figurative language. And not taking this one fact into account could lead to disastrous conclusions. Now, we're really told who goes to, who, who it is that's going to be saved. But in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, we're told that the, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel, unto his servant John, Revelation 1, verse 1. So in the very first verse of the, of the book of Revelations, the first chapter, it tells us that this is in highly symbolic language. Why don't we just believe them? But we're told that who's, who it is that's going to be saved. Here's from Mark chapter 16, verse 15 through 16. And he said unto them, Go ye in all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. So the question is, can animals believe? If they can't believe, and they can't, how can they be saved? But this is just a good, a good way to show you how coming to the Bible with preconceived ideas can certainly turn us astray. In fact, Martin Luther is guilty of the very same thing. You see, one of the reasons why Martin Luther broke away from the Catholic Church 
is because he believed that it was just through grace, not on one's own merits or good work, that one was saved. And having that belief led Martin Luther to say that the whole book of James was as worthless as straw. Now, why would he make such a statement as this? Why would he claim that the book of James, a book written by the Lord's half-brother, one of the twelve apostles who knew and traveled with Jesus, was as worthless as straw? Well, the, the answer is right in the book of James. You see, the book of James just didn't agree with what Martin Luther had already believed. It says, even so, if faith hath not works, is dead being alone. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. James clearly teaches that both faith and works are necessary for salvation, something that Martin Luther had already concluded in his own mind was not the case. Therefore, he made the comment, that the book of James was worthless. Now this is a prime example of why we have so many different shades of belief in the world today. Men are not willing to let the Bible alone teach them the truth of God's way. So when it comes to the Bible, with an, they come to the Bible with ideas that are already in their minds, and they refuse to hear the Bible. Instead, what do they do? They resort to such things as Martin Luther, discarding a whole book of the Bible because it simply doesn't agree with our ideas on what truth is. Is this the way to find truth, friends? To reason with our own minds regardless of what Scripture tells us? If we listen to our own mind and our own reasoning, we are likely to go astray. And many times we may think that something is better off this way or that. But as I said in the beginning, it really doesn't matter what we think. What matters is what God thinks. And if we really want to find out what God thinks and how he feels about things, we have got to let the Bible teach us God's way and not come to the Bible and try to get our verified. So coming to the Bible with preconceived ideas is definitely the biggest reason for so many different churches. Men fail to let the Bible teach them what it has to say. But the second biggest reason is not knowing when to interpret the Bible literally or figuratively. Many preachers and ministers have a big problem with this because they fail to come to a logical reason as to when to take things figuratively and when to take things literal. If they come to the Bible with their preconceived ideas and it doesn't really agree with what they happen to believe, well, then they just easily dismiss it by saying, that's to be taken figuratively. It really doesn't mean what it says. Friends, the Bible tells us that God is not the author of confusion. Now, believing this to be true, how do we then determine what is literal and what is to be taken figurative. Perhaps it may seem to be confusing in some places. Well, let's just stop and think for a moment. If we were going to sit down and write a Bible, and let's say we really didn't want to have to provide a set of instructions with our Bible, uh, and we wanted to have some logical approach because we wanted to use both literal and figurative language, what we'd probably want to do is we would tell the reader what we want to tell them outright. And then if we wanted to do something like, uh, take something figuratively, we would, we would put some clear indication that the message is figurative. Well, this would be the most logical way to approach it. And wouldn't you know that in the Bible, that's exactly what it does. Just to give you a, a, an example, now we, we've already looked at the book of Revelation. We saw that in the very first chapter, the first book of the book of Revelation, it says that the book is to be taken symbolically. 
You can't get very much clearer than the way it's stated on the first verse of the first chapter of the book of Revelation. That, that God had, had said that it is sign language and figurative, and he sent it by his angel. We have no right to ignore these instructions. But in Revelation chapter 12, and at verse 7, most people will totally ignore those instructions, and they'll use these verses to perpetuate the doctrine of an immortal devil. For example, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought against his angels, and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, the old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world, he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, some churches will tell us that this is the recorded instance of the devil being cast out into heaven. But in order to come away with that understanding, we would have to take these words absolutely literal, just exactly what God told us was not the case. He warned us in the first book of his message that it wasn't literal. Now, when we defiantly ignore God's statements and indications, how can we expect to find the truth of God's word? Here's another example of the same thing, and for that matter, the same teaching. This is from Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. So, it goes on, and, 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 and this is the other place where people will, will go to to prove the doctrine of a fallen angel. But if you just back up in that same chapter, just a few verses, to verse 4, it reads that thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? He says it's a proverb about the king of Babylon. God has told us that this is an incident that's not real, but it's about a real person, the king of Babylon, and this is figuratively talking about him and his future. Can anybody expect to find the truth of God when they go right past, right past his clear indications and instructions that God has given to the reader of his word? He tells us as a parable about the king of Babylon. Why don't we believe him rather than try to use this to prove a fallen angel devil? Especially when nowhere in those verses do you find the word angel or devil ever appearing. So these two things, coming to the Bible with preconceived ideas and not being very careful when differentiating between literal and figurative, these are two, two certainly... Uh, major reasons for all of the different misunderstandings in the Bible. Now, also to the list, we could add utilizing only part of the Bible. Now, we saw Martin Luther himself was unwilling to use part of the Bible to learn what God was teaching as truth. Well, today there's many around that feel the same way about the entire Old Testament. Many feel that the Old Testament is passé. It's useless when it comes to learning about salvation. But take a look at some of these verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verses uh, chapter uh, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 through 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 
And at the time the Apostle Paul penned this letter, the New Testament hadn't even been completely compiled yet. Many books weren't even written at this point. So it had to be talking about what? The Old Testament, right? Well, another reason for different interpretations of Scripture is that of laziness. You see, it's a whole lot easier for you to believe me when I tell you to be saved, all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus is Christ and your Savior, and you're automatically saved. So much easier to believe that than it is when I tell you that if you really concerned about your salvation, you better pick up the Bible and read it from cover to cover to learn what God requires of you for salvation. A lot easier to do the first thing than the second, right? It's a whole lot easier to believe that your minister has already read the Bible for you and determine that you really don't have to read it for yourself to have salvation than to be told that the heart of man is desperately wicked. And if you're truly concerned about your salvation, you had better open your Bible and read it for yourself. Isn't that true? Again, let's take a look at what the Bible says. First Thessalonians 5 and 21. Prove all things. Hold fast to that which is good. Study to show thyself approved of, unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2 and 15. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So, if you look at some of this language, study. Prove. Search. Does this sound like a, a passive way will earn us salvation? How can, we expect, how can we expect to learn the truth if we don't search for it in the right places? And there's only one right place to look for it, and that is in your own Bible. And it takes effort. We can't just sit on our laurels and expect to find the truth. And so, how does God expect us to find the truth? And you might ask the question, how am I supposed to find it if these so-called experts themselves can't agree among themselves? Well, it's really not as hard as it might appear at first examination. And we, the Christadelphians, would like to help you with this decision. And please, believe me when I say we're not here just to stand up here to say you have to believe us, because we tell you so. This is not the case at all. What we want to do is we want to show you what the Bible says exactly from its own pages, from your own Bible. Then it's your responsibility to investigate what we say by comparing it with other scriptures to make certain that we're not leading you astray ourselves. The Bible must be open and read and made the center of our life if we wish to have the salvation that God has promised mankind. And when the Bible is open and studied, it reveals some simple and marvelous principles and teachings. So won't you please help, let us help you with this? Now, for the remainder of the time we have left together this afternoon, I would like to look at, at the Bible, at God's Word, and see if you agree with some of its very clear and simple teachings that most of the so-called Bible students and Bible-fearing men and women apparently conveniently overlook. And of course, you must be the judge yourselves. If the Bible puts forth a clearly unambiguous teaching, then that's what God requires you to believe. 
if what you see is not clear, then it's your responsibility to look further into these things for yourself and find out the clear truth of the matter. Now, one of the most important aspects of being a Christian, of course, is following the Christ-like lifestyle that Jesus tells us about. Now, wouldn't you agree that the teaching of Christ regarding our behavior is a pretty important part of the Christian responsibility? Well, let's take a look at some things that Jesus tells us. Ye are the light of the world. A city that sits on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth, giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Nearly all Protestant churches around us today believe that works are not necessary for salvation, just as Martin Luther proclaimed. But notice the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, when we read the words of Christ, and he makes mention of certain behavior and standards, he's not merely making suggestions. He's not merely talking about preferred behavior. He's not merely saying that these things, he thinks it would be nice if we do these things. He's making a command. And in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16, when it states, let your light so shine, and there's no hint of him telling his disciples that they should let their light shine if it happens to fit into what they're already doing. He's commanding them to let their light shine so they see their good works. So Christ is commanding his followers to do works. And most churches around us would not agree with this doctrine or this teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it any wonder that there's 41,000 different Christian groups out there today when they fail to comply and comprehend these clear and simple words of the Lord Jesus Christ? And we logically ask the question, why don't they agree with this simple teaching? And again, the two basic reasons. They don't read the Bible for themselves, and if they do, they've already been taught by others that it's certainly not essential for salvation. The truth of the matter is, humans are lazy. Human beings do not naturally want to do work for God. They would rather satisfy the desires of the flesh. So it's a lot easier to believe mankind when he says, you don't have to work to please God. They've been told that works are not necessary, and they would rather just leave it at that. For this is what we would all prefer to be the case, regardless of the many clear teachings in the Bible on the contrary. Now here's some other examples of some clear teaching. Nearly all the churches teaches, teach that the soul is immortal, that life goes on after death. Going to heaven or to hell, this is what they say the Bible teaches. But if you look at the Bible, you find that nowhere. It's not anywhere to be found. But if you go to Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20, it says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So the Bible teaching is that the soul is not immortal, and the soul does indeed die. Another church teaching. Mankind goes to heaven when he dies. The Bible teaching is And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. So the Bible is teaching that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return from heaven with his reward with him to establish his kingdom. So he's bringing the, his reward back with him. And another verse we could use to verify that is in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 9. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. 
Another church teaching. Jesus is God. Well, the Bible teaching comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. And he was gone forth into the way. There came one running and kneeled to him and asked him, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. Well, Jesus clearly teaches that he is not God. Because certainly, if he wanted to verify the teaching that most churches will tell you is the most important of all New Testament teachings, that Jesus is God, surely this would have been the ideal time to make that teaching clear. But what does he do instead? He says, no, don't call me good. That term is only reserved for God. Now here's another one, also from the Sermon of the Mount, from Jesus. Matthew chapter 5, verses 39 through 40. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at law, and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. So, I'd like to ask you the question. Does this sound like the summary of any Christian communities that you're aware of? Where they wholeheartedly preach that you should resist not evil, you should turn the other cheek, and if you get sued, to take away your coat, give them your cloak also. You see, these are the principles of the Lord Jesus Christ, friends. These are his words, and how can any religious organization justly justify taking others to court and suing them? How can anyone claim that they're turning the other cheek by suing somebody at law? And what religious organizations do you know of that condemns their members for joining the armed services and doesn't support the killing and slaughtering of other members of the human race? Don't they rather tell you that it's all right to kill as long as it's under the guise of a declared war? Where in the Bible does it say that? Where does it say it's all right to kill your nation's enemies, but it's not okay to kill your nation's allies? And reading on the same Sermon of the Mount, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good unto them that hate you and pray for you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now, does this sound like Christ is saying that it's, it's okay to kill the Taliban or Iraqis, but it's not okay to kill your fellow Americans? No, he says, love your enemies. This is the clear teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ, friends. You see, we're not at liberty to make our own rationalization that since they don't agree with us politically, that they pose or they pose some kind of threat to our national security, that it's okay to go out and disobey our master's command and not kill at all. Let's take World War II, for example. The U.S. troops went over to Germany fighting on German soil. Now, were there not Lutheran Germans? Were there not Methodist Germans? Presbyterian Germans? Catholic Germans? Definitely they were. And if this is so, how can they possibly justify the killing of their own brethren? Mankind has the tendency to take the teachings of the Bible and slanting them or twisting them to fit their circumstances and their prejudices. And this will not do. And we could go on and on in pointing out these inconsistencies. We could look at the, the Christian, Christian community as a whole to see how they've, how they've uh, turned aside from following God's word and the words of Jesus Christ our Lord. But you know what? We won't be able to hide behind our ministers our religious organizations and blame them. Not at all. God will require of each and every one of us to give an account what we have personally done, whether it's good or bad. He expects us to give that account at the judgment seat of Christ. And here we see in Matthew chapter 7, at verse 21, it says, 
Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. In order to obtain salvation, the salvation that God has made available to all of mankind, one must do the will of Christ, Heavenly Father. And he makes it perfectly clear in these statements before us. And there's only one way to know what that will of God is, and that's by opening to the book of life, the Bible, and learn what God wants us to do. It won't do to allow our ministers to do it for us, because we have no way of, to know if our ministers have it right or not, unless we open the book and compare what he says to the word of God. You see, God is the ultimate authority, not any man. And he's written down for us what he expects us right here in the Bible, what he expects of us. It's our responsibility to open up and to read it for ourselves and to prove that what we believe is true. And this is the only motive that we, the Christadelphians, have for holding these lectures that we have this afternoon. And that is to plead with you to open your Bible and learn what God has to say about eternal life and follow his commands. Consider John chapter 17 and verse 3. And this is eternal, life eternal, that they might know the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Do we wish to have eternal life, friends? Then we must know the only true God, not the God of the Egyptians, or the God of the Indians, or the God of the Indonesians, but the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he sent. And the Bible is the only place that we can learn this. We must open the only source available to mankind today that is totally reliable for salvation, read what it has to say, and live by its teaching. And we would like the opportunity to help you accomplish, accomplish this goal in any way that we can. Please, won't you, let us help you. I'd like to thank you very much for your kind attention this afternoon. And at this time, our presider will now tell you the many ways that we have available to help you learn more about God's plan and purpose. And it's our prayer this afternoon that you will be men and women in wisdom of wisdom and look closely into these things that could bring you eternal life in the soon coming kingdom. Thank you. Mm -hmm.